comparison. him. Tonight, we're gonna start the show with a showstopper. The iPhone 5 has been announced. Was anyone really surprised that they were gonna do this? Well, we were... Um, no, it's it's not so much the that there is an iPhone 5, but what's gonna be on it. For example, something I've been waiting for for literally years is turn-by-turn -turn directions on maps, because seriously. And that is in it. And also, it's not a surprise that there is one, but Apple's kind of juked with when it would be announced, because it used to always be at Macworld, but then... They stopped announcing at Macworld with the 4S, and then they had the iPod Touch event, and now they just they just held a particular iPhone 5 event whenever they chose to, which was today. Apple shares have already gone up. I am certain. It is thinner so and lighter, no. as always before. 7.6 millimeters and 112 grams. At some point, you think that's got to cap out. It's got to weigh nothing and have no depth. But they made it one more generation of thinner and lighter. This time, the iPhone is simply made of air, and we install it directly into your brain. <laughs> yeah, there's a most quote of our users. There's a quote from the press conference that it is made entirely out of glass and aluminum. And I was like, okay, well, I understand what you mean. I mean, there's you mean there's no plastic in the case. But what that quote means is that there is no copper and no silicon inside. It is just glass and aluminum. In fact, the new iPhone 5 is entirely decorative. It, it serves no practical function because we didn't put any PCs, uh, chips inside of it. So, yeah. Enjoy looking at it. It, it. It's cool when you put it against your face, unless it's been in your pants, at which point it's kind of lukewarm. It yep. has upgraded radios for all the carriers. It has Verizon LTE and Sprint and AT&T 4G, so that should improve data speeds fairly substantially. And it is bigger. The screen has the same width in pixels, but is taller and it is a 4-inch diagonal screen coming from the 3.5 it previously was. iPhones have always been about the same size before, but um, pretty much all other sp smartphones have been tending towards a 4-inch design rather than the 3.5, and Apple has finally followed suit. The 30-pin connector that has always f graced the bottom of iPhones has been totally removed. No more 30-pin cables. Yep. Huh. They have a new proprietary lightning connector that... Okay, well, I, I'm fairly pleased about this, because I always thought the 30-pin was kind of a shoddy connector. It is easy to have it plugged in, like, part way, because it's so wide. You can be like, well, the pins are touching on one side, but not the other, and it is not reversible. And I, I was hoping they would go to a micro USB because that's just what every other phone uses and it'd be convenient to only carry around one set of cables. But the thing I'm very excited about the lightning connector is that it is reversible. You can plug it in upside down and it still works. It is about- I cannot tell you how many times I fumbled plugging this thing in in the dark and had it- much like everything else, you know, you always do it wrong in the first way. Yep. And the the micro USB connector shares that fault, but the fun the lightning connector does not. Um it has a new camera, uh more resolution, a supposedly forty percent faster photo capture, although that iPhone always has appeared to have effectively zero shutter lag before, to me. That sometimes it's a little off. But... Ah. Uh, my device, the Galaxy a Nexus, lag. has, like, literally zero shutter lag, and I think they do that in a fairly naughty way, which is that the preview that they're capturing, they have it buffered, and when you hit the button, they just pull a frame out of the preview. But... And as a result of that, you have to pay attention to focusing it because you can 
hold your finger on the shutter button to make it focus, but if you just tap the button, it will take a picture right then and probably not be in focus if you're not a smart photographer. But 40% faster photo capture should split the difference, be closer to zero shutter lag while still allowing it to think about what it's taking before it takes it. Um... Yes, and there is a new iPod Touch to go along with this. The iPod Touch was kind of lagging a bit since the 4S. The, the 4S did not have an associated iPod Touch, but there is a fifth generation iPod Touch that has, that's pretty much exactly the iPhone 5, but without the radio. It even has the camera and flash, which iPod Touches have never had flash cameras before. Turn-by-turn uh, -turn directions, as we've mentioned. Yeah, it's I, I cannot communicate to you just how terrifying it is trying to navigate, and you're already lost. You already have no idea where you are, but now you also have to not only look at the road, look around, try to figure out where you're going, and also look at the map and deal with traffic. You're not supposed to be looking at your phone while you're driving, yeah, but so, if you don't so know where you're, you're going, you have to. What you want is an Apple Copilot app where it creates a second person in your car to specifically use the iPhone for you. <laughs> well, that would be kind of fancy. But more simply, just want somebody to read out the turn you're supposed to make just before you are supposed to make it. Right. And that's what it has. They've also changed the white earbuds. Iconic white earbuds. They look different now. Kind of freaky. And they have an official name, which is Earbuds with capital B. <laughs> they never had a name before. And Apple now has they're... now trademarked it. If anyone uses it, prepare for lawsuits. There's an article on The Verge that is kind of just specifying that they're now branding their earbuds. It, I did not see a logo, but, I mean, if you're going to brand things, a logo is a must. Hopefully there is one. In other device news... So, wait, can I, can we backtrack a little bit with this connector piece? Because I think we lost over... Are all of these peripherals that I now have that were, you know, specifically proprietary branded to work with the iPhone? The quote are from... Are those all going to be trash now? Maybe. The quote from the press conference is that there will be adapters, and so... Maybe you can make them work with an adapter, but for things like docks, that's probably not going to be a great solution. It might pass, it might be passable, but there will be adapters, and they might not be as great as them being the right connector, so kind of. Right. In other technology news... Amazon has announced a whole slew of Kindle updates, including a new version of the primary e-ink Kindle called the Paperwhite that has a way better contrast, and a two new versions of the Kindle Fire tablet. The Kindle Fire itself is getting a spec bump and a $40 price drop down to $159.00 which getting pretty cheap compared to the $600 iPad price point. And a new version called the Kindle Fire HD, which comes in a 8-inch and 10-inch variation with an incredibly high-resolution screen. The 10-inch version is 1920 by 1200 pixels which I am excited about because screens have basically been capped at 1920 by 1080 since just about the invention of the LCD panel. Uh, mostly for computers because more resolution is expensive, obviously, and that was the point where they were like, this is good enough, we don't really need to get any better. But... For some reason, small screens have been getting increases in pixels, and that's great because um, even small screens are not all at 300 dpi yet, 
which is what would theoretically be as good as an eye can see about an arm's length away from you. But big screens, like the desktop monitor I'm staring at, do not have as good a resolution as this Kindle Fire HD will have. That doesn't make any sense because the pixels are bigger because the screen is bigger, which means I actually need more of them than on the small screen. But manufacturing processes are spread across all devices, so if somebody's making 1920 by 1200 screens, that means they're going to go in other places. Pyro suffering a logic failure. <laughs> also, uh, what might be of interest is uh, the imminent release of Borderlands 2, which is happening within a week, I think. Yep. That'll... Yeah, that's this Tuesday. Yep, that is coming out, in fact. And Pixie I... was having a dilemma as to what platform she should get Borderlands 2 on. Are you thinking about picking this up, Jeff? Yes, and I was almost certainly decided on PC. Yeah, I, I am obviously going to have it on PC because I don't even have the other consoles. Everyone I know that I, I like, wish to play games with these days is primarily using PC as their method of choice. That and keyboard and mouse just works for me better in a first-person shooter environment. Uh-huh. So that... Well, I'd, I, I play Borderlands with my um, wired USB uh, Xbox 360 controller anyway. Right. I don't have Pixie has mentioned that the thing she really prefers about gamepads is that you get analog movement because the gamepad joysticks yeah. are sensitive to lots of degrees, whereas WASD are only on or off. And and it makes I'm going to tell you right now it makes driving vehicles way way easier. Oh yeah. Vehicles in Borderlands 1 were kind of janky because I think they didn't necessarily follow the standard PC control model for vehicles. Their direction was I also based... Get, well, there's, there's that, and uh, even in Saints Row the Third, when, you know, I want to do acceleration, I can use the trigger and get different degrees of speed. Yes, very important. Rather than be flooring it or not. But... I have another story on my list here, which is that Valve has hired an industrial designer and has made some announcements to the to the effect of, we are thinking about manufacturing gaming hardware because we don't think anybody else is doing it well enough. And the thing that I really hope they make is a keyboard that has pressure-sensitive keys. Because the uh, face buttons, ev even the face buttons on a gamepad, are pressure sensitive to something like 256 degrees. And it is not really that technically challenging to do. But just because keyboards have always been switches on and off, nobody's ever thought to make pressure sensitive keyboards. And if you just made WASD sensitive to pressure, then you'd have analog movement on PC natively. I mean, you already have the best of both worlds, quote unquote, on PC because you can just use a gamepad if you want. And in fact, you can use lots of other peripherals like flight sticks and the Razer Nostromo pseudo keyboard pad that I have. But just having a proper keyboard that had and pressure-sensitive buttons go a long Proper way towards sense. making Proper the PC sense. clearly superior to consoles in every way, rather than just most. I, uh, yeah. You, you mentioned Valve and hardware, and I was like, I so want a Steam console. Ooh, and towards that end, Steam recently got a new feature called Big Picture, that is designed for if you put your PC in your living room and connect it to your giant TV, you can now control Steam in big picture mode with a gamepad, and everything is laid out in such a way that it is easy to use from the couch 20 feet away from your giant 50-inch TV. Yes, more, more of this. I want to make my PC into a platform for just playing Steam games. Or, you know, well, all of the other really amazing things that PCs do, like 
let you type or let you surf the internet. You know, those great kind of things. Or, you know, all the editing work that we do to make this show. Yes, I I want that. Said, said, how about, you know, all the... For Steam to work that is sold by Valve, where they're like, yes, everything will work perfectly with this. Sen, what about the, you know, uh, all you the editing work that, that goes into making Everybody this that you show? want to play games with at the moment plays games on PC. Yeah. And I think that is probably a symptom of the fact that the PS3 and 360 are kind of old at this point. Yep. And so even a very cheap modern about- PC can outperform them. And that will swing around the other way again as soon as next generation consoles get announced, I expect. <laughs> Sen, what what about uh, all the editing work and all the other research and hard work that goes into making this wonderful podcast and radio program? What have, about attending your online classes that take place at specific times? I have jumps for online? that. I, I, I mean, colleagues. <laughs> you have chumps for attending your classes. Yeah. That's pretty classy. I gotta get your setup. Right? You just make the excuse that, oh, I, I, I'm not feeling well this evening. Can, can you write down every single thing that happened in class tonight for me? Just need to get the guy. And someone like, goes with that. And, and they go with it. I could probably even achieve that, but my professors are just like, yes, here's an attendance sheet. You get points for signing your name on it. Are you kidding? I'm in grad school. They barely register that we're there. <laughs> Well, there was some hubbub about EA trying to buy Valve for approximately $1 billion. And then Gabe Newell, founder of Valve, was like, I would rather see Valve disintegrate than sell out. So that's not going to happen. Yeah, no, Valve seems to have plenty of money and the ability to distribute their own stuff just fine. Yeah, that... So, does anybody care about uh, the... Um, Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition that is also coming out this Tuesday? It is very interesting. Uh, I'm sure that it will be exciting for a lot of people. It's got new graphics and I think even small amounts of additional content enhanced control schemes. But I think that the people who were really enthusiastic about Baldur's Gate we're playing Baldur's Gate in emulation just fine already. Yeah. And I think that the new graphics will be interesting to some people once. I think the people who go back and play it every year are going to probably go back and play the old version every year. Yikes. I uh, just read that uh, due to contract obligations, it is set to be launched on... Have you ever heard of this Beam Dog for the PC edition and the Mac App Store for the iPad and Mac OS editions? With it being confirmed that the game will not be available for purchase from Steam or Good Old Games. Huh. I've never heard of Beam, Beam Dog. Dog. I have never heard of this either. That is a ridiculous name. It would not only name. utilize the Beam Dog client, but also a launcher available from the Beam Dog site. <laughs> so, wait a minute. Developer that wanted to remake Baldur's Gate, you decided to eschew the two largest distributors known to man for PC gaming to go with Beamdog. <laughs> no, did, no, no, no. Did they, like, Hang fund on. the project for Wait. you or something? Sen, Sen, um, you're not listening. I am. The reason for this is because the remake of Baldur's Gate is being developed by Overhaul Games, which is a division of Beamdog, which includes many of Bioware's ex-employees. Uh, uh, I, I so they went. We're gonna make our own. I, I don't just like everyone else. I don't care if it's made by your own company. You don't askew Steam. That's just the, a thing that I thought the gaming world had learned. The practical uh, consequence of this will be that fewer people play the remake of Baldur's Gate. Right. Then if it had just been, you know, we'll put it out through our service and Steam, and then tons of people are going to play it. Nope, we're going to go with, we'll put it out through our own little thing, and like, ten people will find it. And the rest of them will just emulate the old discs. That's what I had, uh, 
I had observed that, uh, well, EA did the same thing with Origin, and... EA almost has a justification, because they're big enough to get away with it, but... Because they've consumed a bunch of other developers? Yes. And as names go, I just want to object to the fact that Beamdog is not a very good name. That is not a good uh, name for your company. (laughs) You hate it on the merit of the name is silly? Yes. Hate is such a strong word. Can we go by... We belittle you because your name is silly. And on actually, the topic of other can things, get, we belittle I, I'm because on good the old names games are silly. Right now. You can get Baldur's Gate 2 complete on good old games for $10. And frankly, you'd probably be better off doing that than playing the remake. Because Baldur's Gate is a very important game, obviously. Right. I but the original it. is important. Which is remake. also available on good old games. For $10. Doesn't matter very much. <laughs> Speaking of other things we belittle because their name is silly, there is, as of this recording, supposed to be a Wii U event tomorrow morning, which will be when this is airing, that will have the price and release date for the sillily named Wii U. And So, I, I, I guess um, me in the future is just going to have to carry on a conversation based on what you're going to say now. <laughs> yep. Sen and I will not be around to report on gonna, this, but... I was gonna break the story myself, guys. I, I, oh. I plan to be dead by then, so, uh... Yep. <laughs> Sen is going to be dead by tomorrow morning. Tragically killed riding a T-Rex. Today. Today. The moral for you, listener, is that you have to listen to the rest of this program so that you can hear about the Wii U. We can't tell you about it now, but we can tell you about it Vanish. At some point during this program. <laughs> so yeah, um, I, the only thing I have to say about the Wii U is that the idea that Penny Arcade dropped for them this week uh, in last Friday's comic, why can't that be a thing? That sounds, it's an amazing idea. Dungeons right? and Dragons U. The Game Master has the controller with the screen. Everybody else plays with Wii Remotes. And, yeah, the Game Master plots things out on its crazy screen. Like, that is a great idea. That would be the best party game ever. It's like, yes, you and your friends are going to fight the monsters and traverse the dungeon, while the Dungeon Master works one to two rooms ahead, setting up traps and monsters for you. Like, it would be great. It would be exciting, but I'm not sure it makes as much sense as it seems, because if you're playing on a Wii U, that means you have to be in the same room physically together, which means that this experience has to compete with actual Dungeons & Dragons. It's like, well, it graphics, computer graphics are nice and all, but the interface has to be really good in order for the Game Master to do all of the very wild things that a Game Master can do in actual tabletop role-playing games. No, it it would have to be an action RPG. Like, there's no question. You couldn't do, like, the exact social interaction uh, conversation pieces, but, like, it'd just be a silly action RPG. Right. Which means it's basically Legend of Zelda Four Swords Adventure with D&D branding. I, I was thinking, like, an electronic version of Super Dungeon Explorer. Is basically what it would be. Sure. But then at that point, it seems like the Game Master... It would be a challenge to make the Game Master's gameplay fun. That's that's a challenge as it is, though, isn't it? Like, Sen, I'm pretty sure you can uh, attest to... uh, The stress levels... Shall we say? Oh, at that point, at that point in the game, I would just summon eight beholders and take a nap. <laughs> yeah, in actual tabletop role playing, the game master does not have fun so much as joy at crushing the dreams of others. It's now, I, I, I was, take pleasure I in was your quite pain. Quite the opposite at the, as the uh, DM, and in, in fact, it seemed to be my players who got joy out of crushing me. <laughs> 
by being really bad at playing the game? By completely bypassing any kind of social interaction sequences, which I had fun writing and creating those situations, and going to, yeah, we're going to obliterate any challenge out of the fighting sequences that are going to take up, like, 75% of your sessions. That's true. We spent way too, like, a turn of combat takes, like, ten minutes for us. It's terrible. I, I would actually put it more at 25 to 30 minutes. A particular anecdote about one of the players doing an enormous damage to what was effectively a damage mirror, yep. and thereby killing himself. And then blaming me for creating it. Like, well, maybe you should look at something before you cast all of your spells at it. No, it was just one. It was just one really, really big one. <laughs> And and yet I'm still the for creating such a mechanic. Like, that's not in the game rules. Well, the game rules flat out say the game rules are just there as a, a template. You can modify anything. Game Master's word is law. Right? And that is the one thing the Wii U version would avoid. Yep. No rules lawyering. The, the CPU's word is law. Yeah. At, at, at that point, the the physics engine or uh, or numerical rolling system is law. So, you guys, EverQuest just got another expansion. The 19th expansion to EverQuest 1 called Reign of Fear. Oddly enough, it's still doing better than EverQuest 2 ever did. Although, EverQuest 2 is still running and going to get another expansion in November. Yep. <laughs> called Chains of Eternity. But So, way to go, Sony Online Entertainment, I guess. So, while we're talking about MMOs, we've got two stories that we can discuss. Um, first off, NCSoft announced uh, about a week and a half ago that uh, City of Heroes and, and likewise City of Villains are going to be closing their doors suddenly before the end of the year prompting a lot of subscribers to the now free-to-play MMO to go, what the hell have we been doing with our time? <laughs> well, that's probably a question that they should have had before now, so... Yeah, but still, like, the, that has to be... Hey, like, it's almost full. That, that's really crippling that this world that you spent time in is can just suddenly have its servers cut any time the creators deem it necessary. Oh, that's... This is hardly the first MMO that has closed. But this Seriously. is... Seriously. This one was oddly still successful. Like, City of Heroes still had a large percent of, uh, of active subscribers compared to free-to-plays. So did Star Wars Galaxies, but they shut down Star Wars Galaxies to make way for the Old Republic. Exactly. I, I could, Which is also going to free-to-play this fall. I, I could understand this story more if they were announcing that, yeah, it's okay, we're totally going to be putting out uh, City of Heroes 2. And those of you who are subscribing get some kind of cool perk bonus going into it. Like, that I could understand. As it stands right now, just them declaring that, yep, we're done. Bye! Um... It, it seems like brand loyalty is not a thing here, as much as it isn't required in any way, shape, or form. But, uh, yeah, it's just harsh, and my sympathies go out to those people who are actively still playing City of Heroes. It was a cool game. Uh, on the other MMO front, since the last show, kind of a big one has been released. Also by NCSoft, in fact. Yes, Guild Wars 2 sequel to non-subscription MMO Guild Wars 1 has been released. Um, I've been looking over this thing. It actually seems really, really cool. $60 is... I, I guess in the past it did not seem like such a crazy price point, but in the wake of me buying AAA games all day and all night on Steam sales for like $5 a piece, right. I'm like... Even without a subscription fee, $60 is 
a big upfront cost. But I've been considering getting it anyway, just for the prospect of always having a online game to fall back on if there's no other multiplayer thing to get working. Right, I've kind of been using Diablo 3 as that, but uh, frankly, I'm sick of clicking. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this, this actually seems like a good alternative. I've been talking to a couple friends who are already in the game, and they claim to really like it. The character classes are interesting and non-restrictive, actually. There aren't, like, combat roles in the traditional sense of, it's a tank, it's a DPS, or it's a healer. Everyone kind of has a little bit of everything. There is no subscription, but there are some in-game micropayment things. Oh yeah, tons uh, of micropayments. Mostly for cosmetic things, but not exclusively. Yeah, there are a few features that are unlocked through the micropayment system. But, for the most part, it seems to be uh, playable as a free game. Well, free after you pay your $60. You think the hope at NCSoft is that the City of Heroes people will go play Guild Wars 2? That seems to be the theory, although there was a massive uh, demonstration in City of Heroes last Saturday. They basically tried to get everyone online in the same instance of the starting zone, uh, the city square, and ended up creating 33 separate versions of it with all of the <laughs> players there. Was that player-organized or NCSoft-organized? Player-organized. Player no, it, it seems to have had no major effect. But, uh, yeah. I mean, the hope is still there that maybe they can keep the servers live. I mean, heck, what was it that, uh... If I remember correctly, there was the thing where Bungie said they would leave the Halo 1 servers live as long as people were still playing, and they're still up to this day. Huh, I hadn't heard about that. I'll, there look, was, I'll look it up. There was notoriously a occurrence with the Xbox Live servers for Halo 2. Halo 1 didn't even have matchmaking. Oh yeah, it's 2 is what we're thinking about. But yeah, that... It was not that they would leave them on as long as people were playing, but they just were not shutting down servers that were in use. And so there were six people who, after the shutoff date, just stayed in a game for, like, uh, about a week after the shutoff date. And eventually they all kind of got disconnected. Yeah, that's, but yeah. that's what I was thinking the final six is the name of the people who were in the last server of Halo 2 on Xbox Live. That's kind of funny. And one of them did an AMA on Reddit just like two weeks ago. Cool. I'm looking at the Borderlands 2 box art, and the Borderlands 1 box art featured a psycho, one of the enemy types from the game, holding his fingers up to his head, and then, like, a splash of background imagery coming out the other side of his head. Yep. And the Borderlands 2 box art has that, except with two hands and two splashes. Yep. And what I'm hoping is that there will be a Borderlands 3 for the sole reason of the box art will have to feature a psycho holding his foot up to his head. I, I picture a midget psycho just also holding one hand up under the psycho's head. Oh, well, that would work perfectly. You've ruined I all suppose. of my dreams, Jeff. But you know what? In Borderlands 2, you're still going to have an enemy that keeps midget psychos tied to a shield. True. That That's still a thing. Indeed. I suppose we should probably also mention that um, the pandas will be out within a month. Mists of Pandaria for World of Warcraft. Yes, that is what I was referring to. Which is actually no longer on my PC. Um, I don't have it installed either. I, decided I, don't, I don't think I'm ever going back. I decided to try to start it up because uh, Luca has uh, interest in playing it. And so I figured, you know, when she comes to visit, she can use my desktop so she can see it with the full graphics. Because her laptops can't quite handle it. But uh, the moment I started up Warcraft, it was like... Would you like to uh, reorganize your data files to make them more efficient? I'm like, okay, fine. All the Blizzard games have actually just recently done this. I 
started up StarCraft II a couple weeks ago and, and got the same prompt. But as World of Warcraft is doing this, I went to class. And I came back and I had an error message on my computer that's like, could not reconfigure files. Okay, restart it. Files not found. Basically, my WoW install seems to have deleted itself. It didn't want to live anymore. Nope, it was It wasn't done. receiving enough attention. So yeah, I, I no longer have a WoW install because of that. Because of a petition on the We the People website, the White House has released the brewing recipe for the first ale to be brewed on the White House grounds. Woo! There's two of them. There's the White House Honey Ale and the White House Honey Porter. And you can find the recipes at the whitehouse.gov blog. And these will... What's even funnier is that the honey for those comes from apparently the White House has its own official like beekeeping nonsense going on. <laughs> I didn't even know about it. This there, makes me there, laugh there, that there. something was actually done via the We the People website. It, 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 it was harmless and booze related, but something actually happened. I, I suspect that that was actually organized as sort of a get out the vote campaign by the administration. Cause there was buzz around the brewing recipe, and we were like, and the administration was like, "Yeah, come make an account on the petition website, so if you want the brewing recipe, <laughs> and while you're there, maybe consider some real issues that actually matter, you jackanapes." Hey, people! There's beer here now. Will you care about politics? Oh, Basically, that's horrible. No, that that seems to me what exactly what they're doing is uh, kind of a, uh, I don't know, pseudo viral marketing thing. Yeah. To get people involved. And it certainly worked because the petition for the recipe got a number of signatures. That's really funny, actually. I assume that these these brews will be coming to microbreweries near you any time, and like I speak for the. My co-hosts, when we got to find a microbrewery that's brewing these, I know at least curiosity. three in town. Yeah, it's true. You live in a college town, so right. it's going to totally be a thing. Actually, my local microbrewery of choice is uh, getting the mayor of the town to come crack the keg on, or the first keg on their Oktoberfest when it releases next week. Apparently, that's an old German tradition. So I was debating going for that because everyone gets a free glass of it with their meal. Now that I've trained right that sounds conversation. Like a good I hear you may have been playing some games since we last did a show, Jeff. I've been playing a couple and debating on playing a couple more. Um, I've actually been working on getting myself ranked in League of Legends lately. But, uh, oh, on the other How's front... How's that been going? Pretty well so far. Uh, victories for Shivana all the way. Also playing quite a bit of Rengar lately, who I don't feel is as weak as the forums are giving him credit for. Like, a lot of people are calling for him to be buffed right off the bat, but uh, played correctly, he's actually really strong. Like, as far as game-wise goes, I've mostly been focusing on tabletop and miniature gaming. So, like, very little PC gaming has been done lately. I did a little bit of Skyrim. Um, I tried out Lone Survivor and played for about 30 minutes before I kind of lost interest and closed it. Like, I don't know, Pyro, do you have any experience with Lone Survivor? No, I do not. It, it was in the fifth installment of the Humble Indie Bundle, and it, it has interesting systems, like... The idea is that your character wakes up in a city ravaged by a plague where there are horrible monsters uh, roaming around, and you have to leave your apartment, venture out in the city to try to figure out what's going on, and just survive. Um, feed yourself, get plenty of rest, that kind of thing. So it sounds like a non-zombie related um, DayZ mod? Kind of, like, it's, it's not a mod. It, it's not a third-person action game by any means. 
Um, it, it's a side scroller, and a lot of the mechanics come down to being able to stick to shadows, hide from the monsters, and progress to the next areas. Well, it, it certainly has a fairly grim survivalist tone to it. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Like, right from the bat, you know that things aren't going well when your character is roaming around dark, bloody environments with a mask over his face. Uh, Pixie, I'm receiving a ton of wind noise from you all of a sudden. Ah, sorry. Uh, you're back. So yeah, been working on that. Um, playing more of Iris named Tom. I'm probably going to be picking up the full game in a couple days. I looked at that a little bit, and that appeared to be the pipe game from the Microsoft Games Pack for Windows 3.1. <laughs> you with you nicely turn pipes animated to make cutscenes. them reach the goal. Um, I next week I really want to spend some time. No pyro, with... that was just a pipe dream. <laughs> You're right. That was the name of it. Thank you, Pixie. <laughs> I really want to spend time with uh, Team Fortress Two in the new man versus machine mode. Uh, Team Fortress Two is definitely a classic game for a reason. I have not gotten a chance to play much Man vs. Machine myself, but yeah, I, I have like a hundred hours in Team Fortress Two, just I in have, the old versions. A according to my Steam, thirty nine minutes. <laughs> thirty nine minutes. I, I'm literally looking at my Steam page right now, and it says thirty nine minutes played. Well, that's good stuff. I, I think I played is. just enough time to win a match and lose a match. Yep, Pyro... Pyro, uh, I actually didn't realize that I was correct in that statement. I was just making a bad pun. <laughs> well, yep, that's... that's <laughs> that was actually the name of That's it. the name of the game. I was just trying to make a bad joke, and it didn't end up well in my favor. Oh, well. It, it ended up way better in your favor than you ever possibly could have expected. But If you had a pipe of... dream about that joke working well, it would have come true nice. Uh, on the note of things I actually did rather than things I want to do, um, I went to see Total Recall. Ooh. Oh yeah, that's right. You told me that it wasn't as bad as we were expecting. Right? So there's no Mars in it. No, in fact what we have is strictly on the planet Earth where the wealthy upper class people live in the colony of uh, England and on the other side of the planet directly through we have Australia, which is just called The Colony, where the poor people live. And so people typically commute from the colony to go work in England, and then they'll commute back in the evening. And they get there via this really cool thing called The Fall, which is a uh, giant tunnel that goes straight through the planet. It's a series of tubes, really. No, just one. It's, it's the one big tube. But they like you ruined my joke. They they have this really amazing sequence where they pass through the core of the planet, or they pass near the core of the planet. It it goes slightly around it, and uh, and gravity reverses. So it's all very well done. Um, really, it's a set piece movie. Like everything comes down to how cool of a set can we make for everything, because I think we've established that Colin Farrell can't act. Like, I, I hate to say that, because he's in some of my... Oh, perish the thought! He's in some of my favorite movies. Like, I absolutely love Phone Booth. I think I'm such He's a cool incredibly movie. handsome. Also, I loved him in Fright Night, so you might have to take that back. Oh, little... Fright Night was amazing. Fright yeah. Night was I, amazing, I think there's but no... it was hardly Colin Farrell's performance. I think it kind of <laughs> was Colin kinda, Farrell's totally performance. Was. Really? Yeah, Colin yeah, Farrell, in particular, really? did amazing character Really? Because all I remember from our screening in... of Fright Night was, ooh, David Tennant. No, Colin no, Farrell was yeah. great in Fright Night. I love David Tennant, too, but they were both really good in that, and I might have to fight you over this. Okay, I will flat out say Colin Farrell's acting does not carry this movie. Okay. Considering okay. the majority will... of it is picking off of uh, The Last Airbender, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. I, I will concede that. Um, however, we do have one of my absolute favorite actors as the primary villain in the movie, uh, Brian Cranston, uh, who is the main character, Mr. White, from Breaking Bad. 
is absolutely great as uh, Chancellor Cohagen, a former war hero who is now the head of uh, of England. But he, when you say there's the rich city and the colonies, which is the poor city that does all of the actual work, it's not a city; I, it's I'm the sen- whole country. <laughs> I am sensing some ninety nine percent versus one percent themes yeah, in this movie. without a doubt, that that theme is just constant. Although, I will say, they are not beating you as hard over the head in this movie with that theme as Batman was. I didn't think it was even that thick in Batman, personally. Oh, it was pretty thick. Listen to it Bane's It was speech. thick, but also muddy, so... Right. The, the argument fell apart quickly. No, in this one, the argument falls apart when the rich people are like, You know what? Screw the poor people. We'll make new poor people. Send robots to kill all the poor people. Yeah, go kill all the poor people, they say. And so Colin Farrell's Quaid has to stop the robots from killing the poor people. Uh, Also of note in this movie, Kate Beckinsale as the Terminator. As the Terminator? Yeah. I thought this was Total Recall. So Kate Beckinsale is taking Sharon Stone's role from the original movie of Quaid's fake wife, who's actually a, like, an agent of the government monitoring him. And, like, once it gets out who he is, she is, like, all committed to killing her former husband. Like, in ways that, honestly, I don't think anyone values their job this much. Like, she's chasing him through highways, uh, through elevator banks that work in, like, three dimensions blowing things up, throwing grenades. Like, nothing brings this woman down. Unstoppable. Yeah, she's completely unstoppable in every way. Um, the, the one big compliment that I have for the movie is that they don't bother with... They, they have references to the previous movie, but they don't feel the need to follow it scene for scene. Well, apparently not, since there's no Mars in it. There's no Mars, um, there's no Quato, which made me really happy. Okay, um, there is a notable character in the original Total Recall who had three memories. She is, uh, it's not the same woman. She's totally in it. It's not the same woman, but there is a three-breasted woman in this movie. Excellent. Likewise, um, excellent insofar as this this is all really stupid. Yeah. Pyro, did you not see the previews where... Like, she makes an appearance and is all, like, as she's opening her shirt, she's like, you're going to wish you had three hands. Uh, yeah. I did not see those previews. Um, I, to be honest, I had not been following coverage of this movie terribly closely. My right. hopes were not high. Like, is it the smartest movie ever? No. Is it an enjoyable roller coaster set piece movie? Yeah. Yeah. Don't expect to, like, be deeply questioning anything, because even the movie's like, you know what, we don't even want to bother to ask the question, is this real or is he at recall? Whatever. We don't care. Here's some more shooting scenes. Here's a gravity (laughs) car that can go both above and below the highway, because that's cool. Well, I feel like if you're making a movie in the spirit of the original Total Recall, making it dumb is probably a good place to start. Right. At at one point in the movie when he's traveling up to the up to England from the colony, like they they do the whole uh customs thing where he's in the disguise trying to get through, but like they have the woman from the original Total Recall that Arnold was hiding as, like the fat woman with the fake head. Ah. They have her standing in front of Quaid. Whereas huh. Quaid, this being a more intelligent, technologically advanced movie, is wearing this collar thing around his neck that projects the fake face over his. Rather than, you know, a fake robot exploding head that sits on top of his. Fancy. So, like, yeah, they have references throughout the movie to the original, but by no means are they forcing themselves to just shot for shot it. Is there any Johnny Cab? Uh, no, there is no Johnny Cab joke in this one. Good, because Johnny Cab was creepy and scares me. No, they have their own car in this movie. So the car chase scene is actually really amazing to watch, since it takes place both above and below the highway. Like, uh, a big theme of the movie is space, as in the, the 
two areas that the movie takes place in are the only habitable areas on the planet. So they're going to be built up vertically to insane degrees. So every bit of space is used in some way. And so when they switch directions in their car, they literally go under the highway. Very fancy. Yeah, it's a really cool scene. Uh, next week's plans. Possibly some Guild Wars 2. Definitely some Dread. I will Dread? be so about seeing Dread. I I have not even heard of Dread. This, is this Judge Dread? This is the Judge Dread coming out next week. I'm amazed that I'm not aware of this movie. Yep, it's a thing. Uh, we'll definitely talk about that. So yeah, uh, that's supposedly coming out the 21st. I will probably be there the first day, as this is already getting great reviews. As the first ever excellent adaptation of Judge Dredd. <laughs> the first ever adaptation of Judge Dredd that hasn't just been just terribly, terribly bad. Hey, you know what? He leaves the helmet on. That's what you need for Judge Dredd. Also, you need Judge Dredd to be incredibly terrifying a horrible world but also funny it needs to be it needs to be the worst thing that's ever happened and also hilarious and satirical at the same time supposedly the, it's there the previous judge dread movies have just been scary and not funny yeah let's let's just keep rob schneider away from everything So yeah, Judge but more Dredd about that next with, time. With a female villain. <laughs> the drug lord named Mama. So yeah, that'll be a thing. I, I, assume, we're, I assume we're not talking about Cooking Mama because that would be weird. <laughs> you know what? I now think someone has to draw that. That needs to be a Judge, but In the actual Cooking comic, Judge Dredd versus Cooking Mama, Cooking Mama could be a Judge Dredd comic. No lie. That's like a Breaking Bad type of crossover there. That could actually be really interesting and compelling. Indeed. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, so we're running kind of long on this bit, so we're going to wrap up, and um, you two are going to bow out, and then I'm going to get take over for the rest of the show. So we'll see you after this break. In the meantime, I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And I'm Pyrosim. And, well, Oof. I'll catch you in a few minutes. All right, that was Goche's Somebody That I Used to Know featuring Kimbra, followed immediately by Rise Against Savior. Uh, we've got a call in here from Pyro Sim, one of my Hello. lovely co hosts here. Pyro, can you hear us? Yes, I can. I know we told you like five minutes ago that I wouldn't be here, but I'm here. Hello. All right, sorry, missed your audio there. Uh, hello? Ah, there we go, gotcha. I know that we told you, listener, that I wouldn't be here ten minutes ago, but now I'm here. Hello? Yeah, I, I have a frequent habit of lying to my listeners. It's rather terrible. Sometimes thing, circumstances it? change. I suppose, yes. You understand. Are. You're a soldier. <laughs> That's why I shot missiles at the spaceship you were on, dooming the entire galaxy. Okay, weird random obscure Mass Effect 3 reference of the morning officially accomplished. <laughs> I guess that I means that... I those in. Well, I guess that means I don't have to get honest about uh, covering cosplay or something. <laughs> Indeed. Instead, let's cover the Wii U announcement. Yeah, because that um, press conference thing is going on right now. Literally right now. I'm amazed how quickly they got into the good information. See, it is one hour and eight minutes into the conference. It is still going. But they got the price and release date in like the first five minutes. After yeah, so we've got an official North American release date for the Nintendo Wii U console, which is... All right, so that's coming out November 18th. So that'll, you know, be just in time for a holiday thing of course they'd be stupid not to do that right they even made fun of themselves on stage when announcing the release date they were like yeah we're gonna make holiday of course we're gonna make holiday 
act like they would have to be idiots not to. Especially, especially with how well the um, the Wii console sold. That's like what the best selling console ever, ever, ever. Yep. Yes, it is. All right, so it's going to have two different packages. There's the basic quote unquote version for two hundred ninety nine ninety nine, so about three hundred bucks. Um, that includes a white gigabyte, uh, white eight gigabyte console. Excuse me. Uh, one gamepad, AC adapters, sensor bar, and an HDMI cable. The deluxe edition is about 50 bucks more and includes all of that. It's black instead, and the console has 32 gigabytes uh, with charging cradles and a copy of Nintendo Land, which, we just, which I just actually looked at a Metroid-themed level for. It looks pretty interesting. Uh, European release date is November 30th, in case we've got any listeners over there. Hello, Europe. Um, Japan's release obviously was announced last night at their conference, so... And I'm also pretty sure we don't have anybody over there. Relatively certain. Konnichiwa, Japan. It's still morning over here, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Time zones. Did we ever say the proper price? The deluxe is fifty dollars more, but uh, the basic is three hundred. Yes, I I did already mention that. Ah, oh, I'm sorry, I missed it. Yeah, two ninety nine for ninety nine for the basic and three forty nine ninety nine for the deluxe. Cool. So, any games you're looking forward to on that? I'm certainly not looking forward to playing. Epic Mickey 2. Which you didn't have to play the first go-round, so bite me. I did play the first go-round. I didn't have to, but then I did, and that was one of... That was a mistake. Wait, why did you do that? I didn't know that it was going to be quite so bad. I played it even before we covered it. Uh, Because Sen and I forced ourselves... That was one of those, I would rather be washing your dishes than doing this games... I was a big fan of Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, and to that end, I figured that Disney had some brains in its head with respect to video games, and apparently I was incorrect, and Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 were entirely on Square's shoulders, and once Square was not around to babysit them, Disney could not make video games anymore. It was rather sad, but, you know, oh gosh... Uh, go dig through our archives and find that review if you like uh, more details on that at nerdtalkshow.com. Ding. But, um, yeah, that that one was bad, and I'm not looking forward to this. There's also, I guess, going to be a 3DS offshoot in, in that same vein called Epic Mickey Power of Illusion. Whoop. Uh, so far, my 3DS continues to be a vastly overpriced paperweight. Yay. I, I guess You're a 3DS ambassador, aren't you? Since you got in early? Uh, yes, I picked it up in the midnight launch. And I Very also nice. did a story on that for uh, WFLY TV. Very fancy. Yes. So, you got, like, some free games one time as part of the ambassador program? Is that what that got you? Yeah, it was like some old classic type things. Ah. And then nothing has come out since then. Um... There's well, there's also uh, it's 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 mostly still in the gimmick stage. I hate to say it, but it is. Uh, I wanted to like this so much. I guess the Pokemon Black and White Two are going to have 3DS ports, which is something. But I feel like that's going to be tacked on because that's it's also being released just for the DS. So it's that's kind of crazy that it is a port on. rather than an exclusive. Especially, you know, first uh, Pokemon se- Pokemon Direct sequel ever. Like, this is the first time they've stuck a two on there instead of doing whole new region, whole new thing. Or There's... a remake of the same storyline. It's, it's going to be a continuation off of that one. 
which is weird, and I have no idea how they plan on doing that. Yeah, and that's like, unusual. Yeah, because the, how are you going to start? Like, are you still going to be playing as that same character? What's I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure how to how to go about that. Uh, that strikes me in the same way as like Final Fantasy X two or thirteen two, because. Uh, Final Fantasy games were always like Pokemon. They had very little to do with each other in terms of storyline. And then very late in the cycle of the franchise, they started making sequels. And I don't know that any of the sequels have been especially good. I guess my hopes are higher for Pokemon than for a Final Fantasy sequel. The fundamentals are more critical than the storytelling. As long as there's cute critters, a Pokemon game will probably carry. Also to be included in the Wii U console is Nintendo TV. That is capital T, capital V, and then two lowercase i's. They they spell all these things weird as a branding thing. Um, It's apparently a service that's included with the console, so no monthly fee. Um, that incorporates, quote, a personalized programming guide, unquote, to watch TV and video on the console. Um, in fact, this photo here I'm seeing from the conference looks an awful lot like Netflix. It's it's not, but it looks an awful lot like. In fact, it is an amalgamation of Hulu Plus, Amazon Video, and TiVo's on-demand video service. Mm. It's pretty much every internet video other than Netflix pretending to be Netflix. Basically. But, it, hey, you know, not... Charging extra for that sounds pretty good to me. Indeed. So, uses the gamepad as a controller. I think, yeah, they, they announced at last E3, right, that you can have up to two of those pads now on a console instead of just the one. Yes, they did. And up to four. And that comes at the controllers. price of having half frame rate on each pad. Mm-hmm. Is that going to be really as big of a deal, though? I, th- I think it would be, you would think it would be worth it, if for no other reason than, you know, how do we put this? Not having to live with the shame of saying that you can only have one controller? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's certainly the reason why they made that concession. I don't think Nintendo was happy about announcing that you could have two gamepads, but the reason they did is just for the shame. Because I think everybody collectively kind of um, had had a bit of a a heart-stopping moment where they were like, you can only do what? Yep. The other thing is that since they made that change so late in the development cycle of the console, it will probably be a decent while before games that utilize two game pads are on the market. And so of course, none of the launch ones. And if you do. don't have the software, you cannot sell the hardware. Nope. Which is why uh, I've noticed a lot, a lot of um, Xbox Connect titles are kind of floundering to the wayside as well. Yeah. Yeah, Xbox Connect is in a bit of a situation where nobody buys the games because nobody has the Connect, and nobody buys a Connect because there aren't any games. And yeah, they had a nobody very makes the games because nobody has the hardware. Yeah, they're very um, they had a very weak launch, I think. I mean, I'd, I'd, seeing and getting my hands on games like Dance Central and stuff and such was really cool at launch. But and there then was, it was nothing like, to follow it up. And then it was like, that was it. And I know they've, yeah, added, they've added a whole bunch of the... I've, I've gotten to see firsthand the, um, the way that the voice commands and such work. And that's still really cool. And I'd like to see that integrated more. I believe the Kinect briefly held the wor- world record for fastest-selling consumer electronics product of all time and was quickly surpassed, I believe. But the way it went is that the Kinect had a very strong launch, and there was actually 
a bunch of software at launch for a launch, but it was like right after launch, nothing else came out for like eight months. It was just the launch software, and that was it. And as a result, everybody sold their connects. I'm looking at this Lego City Undercover game that they're talking about in the press conference, and that certainly piques my interest for Wii U software. We're um, catching the uh, press updates off of TheVerge.com in case anybody else wants to have a look-see at that and also not accuse us of stealing things. (laughs) They have a very fancy live blog that tells you the information from the press conference as soon as it is spoken aloud. I didn't think it was possible for me to care less about the Monster Hunter franchise, and somehow I do. Do, Is there Monster Hunter? Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate coming to Wii U and 3DS. Hmm. I have no desire to even come near it. I my only foray into this franchise other than spectating it uh, when it was played on the PSP uh, was I tried to get into it uh, on the Wii title Monster Hunter Try it's just a slog yeah I, I've certainly never had any interest in actually playing any Monster the Hunter the premise game. the I- premise I liked is that you could, like, you know, go out and kill these monsters, and then you can craft your own armor from that. That seemed cool to me. There's some cool-looking graphics in it. It's just actually playing the game. I was... It's I was boring. It's boring. It's a load of work. There's a lot of minutia and meta that is never really explained. It kind of assumes that everybody who's in this has already been in And, of course, I'm dredging up all these points that we made in the review forever ago, but it was a long time ago, so I'm, I feel justified in bringing them up back up. So much tiny text drove me nuts. It's just everything's buried in menus. and The, the only good thing that that brought us was the classic controller. That was, that was bundled in with it. The classic controller is important, yes. And just don't use it to play Monster Hunter. It, yeah, the, the, only, the only thing was that I um, ended up selling my Wii long, not long after that. <laughs> so not only was I turned off of this franchise, I totally abandoned the console, too. It's like, this game was so bad. <laughs> I don't even need my Wii anymore. Oh, oh no, oh no, oh, oh no. I, I just read a headline that I, I suppose I should be happy that Sen is not here in the studio with us. Bayonetta 2 coming exclusively to Wii U. Ha. Oops. Well, that is crazy on a number of levels. I guess Bayonetta sold okay. It wasn't good, but it sold okay. But having it be a Wii U exclusive, very strange. Seems like a fairly graphically driven game. Oh boy, there's a trailer. I don't have sound that I could watch it with, but, you know, there's a trailer. You have neither sound that you could watch it with, nor any interest in it. Uh, Coming exclusively to its next-gen platform. Yeah, that's... Gosh, this game, the original came out in 2010. It feels like so long ago, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It's only been two years. Yep. I'm going to watch this trailer with no sound, but I want to watch this and rain of bullets. There's a sword. Okay, there's a sword involved now. Bayonetta was frequently all about guns. So, or previously, rather. That is probably the shortest trailer I've ever seen, and that explained nothing. (laughs) <laughs> it was like the opposite there was, of the Ground Zeroes trailer that was 12 minutes long. No, that was that was very short, and it was just a flurry of bullets, and they're slowed down, and they're stopped. And they're just kind of suspended in midair, and then you see a sword cut through them, and then the sword falls. And then you see some dude standing in the background, wearing a very ornate <laughs> cloak. And that's it. I was like, this tells me nothing about what this game is going to be about or like. 
Except that I assume there's going to be a sword involved. I don't know if this is just some secondary character or who you're going to be playing as instead. Or that, that that probably won't happen because the developers, right. hand, the developers handcrafted, I see what you did there, uh, Bayonetta's tush with far too much love and care to abandon her so readily. For the listener, uh, Platinum Games, the developer of Bayonetta, is actually the current development house in charge of Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, the Raiden game, which has, as one of its most notable features, insane cutting physics. Like, dynamic, physics-driven cutting. Because Raiden has a sword, and he cuts everything. All right, so have we got anything else on this that we feel like mentioning here? The thing about Monster Hunter is that it was always kind of regarded as the reason the PSP sold at all, the reason the PSP was not a complete bust for Sony. And it was to Sony handhelds what Pokemon is to Nintendo handhelds. Yeah, I'm looking at this price point here, and it's a lot of a lot of this is speculation that since it's only 300, that is basically just being set just above cost, so they don't lose money on it. Nintendo is notorious for always making lots of money on their hardware, and this represents a bit of a change of form for them. They got lots of public relations damage from the previous console generation because their hardware was so inferior to the 360 and the PS3. They did well right at the very beginning of the generation, but then they just took a nosedive at the end of the generation because their hardware was so cheap. They decided to take the opposite tack this time and put some nicer hardware out, although I still don't think this will compete with Durango or Orbis when they come out. But they're not taking quite as much margins on their hardware this time. They're investing in it a bit. All right, I'm trying to find some more information on this Nintendo Land thing. I'm not coming up with a whole lot. It's basically just there to showcase the gamepad and act as kind of a mini game collection tutorial style thing. Reminds me of Clumsy Ninja from yesterday's Apple event. This Clumsy Ninja was like a demo they had for the iPhone 5. Yeah, apparently. And like, yeah, it's some software. You can play it. Yeah, so here, yeah, it's just they're taking those IPs that they have, Animal Crossing, Donkey Kong, Legend of Zelda, and now Metroid. And it's theming, um, taking some theme park-like aesthetics to it. And mixing it with those IPs and using it to, I guess, teach you the basics of using the gamepad. And they're like little, uh, there's also like some little multiplayer minigame things. Huh. That's, yeah, it's, you know, it's one of the games is, is a little mini multiplayer game that's set in the Animal Crossing IP. And you use the Wiimote, or the Wii U remote, rather, to, uh, run around a field and gather candy. That's... V- really very basic, but I guess that's kind of the Wii's... the Wii family's thing, isn't it? It's simplicity. Uh-huh. Oh, I know a software that is not mentioned in today's press conference that I am looking forward to from the previous E3... There's going to be a Rayman game on Wii U that has some asynchronous multiplayer such that one person is using gamepad to do different things than other players who are using the Wii remotes. And that will be probably the more sophisticated software on the Wii. <laughs> Call of Duty Black Ops. I'm just, I'm seeing big I'm, announcements too. Yeah, Transformers Prime, the game, 007 Legends. Nothing about them, just little announcements. 
you. Uh, I, I guess the announcement for Black Ops is Black Ops 2, the same Black Ops 2 for other platforms. Yeah, and basically the, the announcers are just going on about how these look identical to the Xbox 360 and other console counterparts. Which is ironic because the Xbox 360 is between seven and eight years old at this point. Yeah, um, it's 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 right here that these look no better or worse than the other uh, than the competition. Well, that will not cut it in by next holiday when the other platforms have got their new machines out. What I can't. Yeah, what I what I can't really figure out is things like re-releasing stuff onto this console that is is and has already been out for the other ones. For example, Mass Effect Three, like that's been out since March. I guess early a lot March. Of the audience, the original we sold to, was people who had basically never played games ever. I'm using products like We Fit and stuff, they sell to uh, older audiences that weren't familiar with video games. And that's so, right. That's a very important part. Yes. And it's clearly done well for them financially. So it is possible that people... It's strange that it would be Mass Effect 3 because I guess you would have had to play Mass Effect 1 and 2 for 3 to have nearly the impact it has had on us. But it is conceivable that there could be some audience that has never played video games on any other platform that would need these re-releases. For Nintendo, in a way that it would not be conceivable for Sony or Microsoft. The other side of that is just that we need software. Software takes time to develop. Let's port things, because that's faster. Yeah, I, I suppose you're probably right there. Still, it's kind of... And I, I know what they're doing as far as tapping into the non-hardcore non, ga non gamers. I, I hate that phrase, but I don't know how else to communicate that. It the, is an the awkward phrase, but it's well understood. By the non-AAA titles that, were, that you and I are used to and tapping into the market that doesn't have the interest or capacity for those it, it, it is important and i'm not saying that these aren't real games or whatever they're they're just not to my palate and i guess that's they're not selling me on this and i guess what i'm feeling is a little bit of i don't know in loss of privilege i guess that i i know i'm not the target anymore for this that i'm not the one being sold to at this point right I, I don't know how else to how else to uh, communicate that idea, but it's a little bit sad. I understand for me as a for me well. personally. Yeah, used to being courted by every game company ever. Now they don't care about you as much. I'm still waiting for my Animal Crossing 3DS title. That would Animal that Crossing is jump really out. What they should make? It's been in development for ages. It was supposed to have come out over a year ago. It keeps getting delayed. They should release that. They should get it done. Because and that that, be that was gonna move units. Yes. Let's see. I've got I've got the the reminder for that one set. Where is it? Other than the Dungeons yeah, it's it's now it's it's, it's now it, it went from like March of last year to to spring to summer, kept getting push push push. It's it's now like to be announced first first or second quarter of 2013. That's totally unacceptable. I wanted to have this in my hand two holidays ago. This is Animal Crossing, not Duke Nukem Forever. What are you doing? Exactly. <laughs> The other game that they really ought to make for Wii U that I think there's no announced intention of them making is a Pokemon Snap sequel because the Wii that would U be amazing has, has accelerometers in it. And the way you would implement Pokemon Snap on the Wii U is that you stand and you control the direction of your camera by moving the gamepad around. 
you see through your viewfinder by looking at the gamepad, and you just view the world through the gamepad, and you turn your body when you want to turn your camera. Uh, yes, that's amazing, and when can I have one? Also, <laughs> they're... <laughs> See, it's Nintendo is kind of dropping the ball by not making this. Because Pokemon is always a system seller. Pokemon Snap is well-loved. And this uses their crazy hardware in an interesting way that very few other things do. It, it, especially since... Uh... Holy cow, is Pokemon Black and White 2 coming out, like, October 7th? Gosh, that that seems really close. It's like tomorrow. Did, no, that's not tomorrow. But <laughs> it's next month. That's only it's only a couple weeks away, I think. Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah, three weeks and change. So, I'm surprised we haven't heard more about that. But I guess they got to keep all those details on lockdown, or that's like you know most of the lure is gone at that point. They can't wave the. Uh, it's shiny and different stick at you. Uh huh. They give everything up all at once. And then we'll never call again. Yep. <laughs> I apologize, that was that was in poor taste. <laughs> Evidence has shown that to be untrue as well. Uh, there's a let's see, I'm trying to go through anything that's coming out for the three DS that will possibly justify this purchase that I made because lately I've been tr well and truly missing my DSi XL that I traded in in order to acquire the 3DS at launch. With that giant screen and the full-size touchpad, oh, it was so nice. But, it's a big DS. Uh, there's a new Harvest Moon coming out for the 3DS. That'll be out November 6th. Or when you want your dating sim to have cows in it. <laughs> I honestly ignore the dating sim part and just play it for the cows. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> the cows are great. I like the cow part, too. <laughs> I'm just like la -dee -da. I like I like the farming bit. And they're kind of I hit like or miss farm. for me. Um, gosh, what was the GameCube title? That one I loved a lot. A lot of hilarious Lost in Translation bits there, but... Um, a Wonderful Life. Yes, that's the one. I I loved that when it was... So, the, the, there goes all my hardcore gamer cred, right? <laughs> what? Harvest Moon is like... Harvest Moon is super hardcore. It doesn't seem like it, but it's so old that... And it doesn't get lots of mainstream coverage because it's kind of esoteric. It's like... It's kind of like Cooking Mama in that it wouldn't seem to be hardcore, but it is hardcore. Yeah, people get very serious about that, I notice. Cooking Mama is notorious for being one of the more difficult games, just in general, like Dark Souls level. Let's see, October 28th, we get a new Professor Layton. I don't know, I never really got into those. A new Skylanders title. Now the, that's that, that's a blatant money grab that franchise. Yes, an effective I mean, one, but because it's built around merchandising, with everybody in TV and movies and everything else says the money isn't in media. The money is in plastic toys based on the media. And Skylanders includes the plastic toys. Yep, there's a Monster Hunter Four set to come out on the 3DS uh, to be announced for spring of 2013. So you were correct. Cool. I know it's not often that you get to be correct, I suppose, but, you know, <laughs> just this once. I'll take it. I'll hold my breath until next time. I don't know how I'm going to talk so that I can be correct for next time without breathing, but, you know. Yeah, no, I'm just having a heck of a time trying to find anything out for the 3DS that's going to just... Possibly that Harvest Moon game. They, they, they tend to be kind of hit or miss. I tried once, and I can't remember the title for the life of me, but I did try a title that was Harvest Moon plus Dungeon Crawler, which sounded really cool, but was really poorly executed. Uh, Stab in the Dark. Uh, no, it wouldn't be Hero of Leaf Valley. No. 
And it was, I believe, the Harvest Moon IP. It's not like a, it's not a, I'm using that as a cross-pitch type of thing. Uh Uh-huh. Gosh. Yeah, Hero of Leaf Valley is a Harvest Moon title. Harvest Moon colon. Ah. I have no idea. Yeah, I'm not sure either. They've made quite a few Harvest Moon games. Since they all get to be fairly similar to each other, so... And, and I, I don't suppose that I could possibly be faulted for forgetting, you know, one of the billion Harvest Moon titles. No, especially because the particular subtitles don't especially mean anything. They really They're don't. Like, this is a different Harvest Moon game. We put some words on it as a subtitle. Yes, that's, that's exactly how they named those. All right, so we've mentioned earlier that Borderlands 2 is coming out um, Tuesday, September 18th. So, have you and I both have our pre-orders in. Hurrah. Do you have any idea what class you're going to be playing? Well, a friend of the show, Courtney Terry, mentioned that the class... Who is Sparkly Kiss over on uh, Giant Bomb. Yes. There will be a class called Necromancer. Not in it at launch, but as free DLC for pre-orders. And I think I am sold on that class on the basis of the name alone. Because for a it's a crazy name. Well, yes, but what about at launch? Hmm. I do not know off the top of my head the classes that are in it at launch. I'll have to look it up. Well, you've got the Commando, the Siren, the... Uh... Gunzerker and the Assassin. Zero, the robot. I know a lot of people are going for him. I'm calling dibs on Siren. That's what I'm saying. Do you call Maya in this game? Do you, are there... There's only one lady again? Of course. Are you surprised? I'm not surprised, but I am disappointed. Gearbox, I am disappointed. Well, then I will probably play as the character with the turret, because I would play as the siren also, but it's interesting to avoid duplication. That will be Axton, the commando. The duplicate of Roland from the first game, who I played primarily. I played Lilith and Roland, the siren and the commando. Also, I guess the character, the the player characters from the first game are now uh, NPCs. NPCs, yeah. So that'll they be interesting. Have lots of dialogue and storyline involvement. I still feel like I've hardly made a dent in uh, the first game, and I should. Okay. But gosh, we're just so dang busy. I cannot find the time to sit down and dedicate. Like I'm gonna grind out some levels in anything. I managed to get, like, maybe 20 minutes farther into um, my Insanity playthrough on Mass Effect 3 because I'm still trying to, you know, get my Chivos. See, now that's all of your hardcore cred forever. I mean, no Harvest Moon could ever take about, take away that much hardcore if you're playing through on Insanity. It's, honestly, it's right now it's not that bad. Later in the game it's going to be really, really terrible and I'm going to, like, want to cry. But... Uh, listener, this is not the first Mass Effect game she has played on Insanity. She's been to this rodeo before. Uh, <laughs> uh, stop, you're making me blush. Hardcore. Nah, my, yeah, to... I'm, I'm running my Vanguard through, and so that way I'll have Biotic Charge. So it's like, hey, here's a free way to get my shields back up. So it's honestly not that hard right now. I'm going through and playing the N7 side quests that way I have lots of money and gear for the admittedly much harder main story arc yep a very wise way to pursue it in order to actually beat Borderlands we would need like 40 hours um, and I mean if we semester, and man, there's if no I way had... we could find four yeah, in in a good weekend or something, sure, that's totally doable. Right now, not so much. Nope. Although, uh, although fall break is coming up here 
at Lewis in just a couple weeks. So that might be a thing. Well, now I'm all eager about it. This could be exciting. Video games are good. I like video games. Nah, really? <laughs> I thought we spent hours on them every week so that, you know, you could tell me how much you hated them. Well, partially that. Mostly just to hang out with you. That's the end of those, though. Maybe my umbrella love for video games doesn't go quite that far. Ah, I like MMOs. They're all right. The Old Republic's pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's almost fall, and wasn't Old Republic supposed to go free to play sometime this fall? Yes. Have we heard anything else about that? I haven't fired up my client in weeks. It feels like. Oh, all of the games journalism sites have kind of stopped reporting on it because most of them are oriented around the concept of providing reviews as purchasing advice. And purchasing advice is no longer relevant for the older public. And then the other side of that is because of the financial troubles, the older public doesn't have any marketing budget. So there's no, the information will not come to you if you do not go seeking it out. Um, and I have not personally sought it out just because we have been so busy with the semester, as mentioned. Well, um, in case you remember the fan favorite um, currency reward that they, the, they had that Facebook poll about, we, yeah. to, to the great surprise of absolutely no one, Party Jawa won. <laughs> Party Jawa. So that's the um, subscriber's reward for upon launch of the free-to-play system. What were the other options, do you remember? Do you, you know, I, I, feel I think that there was like a Wampa or something, and there was a droid of some sort. I, I don't know. It was, I must be holy. There was something oh, mundane. A assassin droid as something? No, you're thinking of that's a new companion that came out like a patch or so ago. Yeah, you're right. That's okay. available to everybody. You just play through that story quest. Cool. I'm still trying to find more information on this free play option and when it's supposed to launch because I feel like they announced that a while ago yeah particular dates I, I have also been searching for them and i have not found a specific date yet um uh, all i'm getting is vague stuff like game update 1.4 terror from beyond uh coming to live servers in a matter of weeks uh it will include facial expression emotes um, you'll be able to match the colors of your companion's gear, so Kaizen Fast will no longer look like he does not know how to dress himself. Very important. I mean, some of those companions, it's like, I don't want to be seen with this because the armor clashes so badly. I'm just embarrassed. I and mean, you fight okay, but you're going to bring shame to me if I go out adventuring with you. I am, I am quite certain that they announced specific dates for free to play, but I have not found them yet. No, all I remember seeing was uh, was sometime this fall. I do I, I, I've seen a lot of things that say an as of yet unannounced date this fall, so you might be right. Hopefully, they will get on the ball with that because the older public is a fun game we should play it especially the parts that are going to be free because those are the class storylines very exciting stuff no that's you know the story bits the free part which is the main draw so i don't know if that's really smart or really dumb on their part to be honest yeah well it seems like you and I are a bit exceptional in that, you know, operations and raids do not interest us as much as storyline. 
it seems like there is a very large audience that cares a lot about operations and raids. And they will probably engage in microtransactions to get to that content. And the other answer is, it seems like they don't have much to lose, apparently. Didn't I free the free trial that's going on right now? Didn't that used to be only up to level 10? Yes, it appears to have gotten a five-level bump. Yep, so now it's up to level 15. It's free right now. They they just keep loosening that uh that rope there. Yep. Must be in some dire straits, which sucks because I kind of really wanted to see this succeed. Yeah, it seems like it should have. It had the Bioware name on it, and Bioware has just made amazing game after amazing game. It had EA publishing it, which has enormous budgets. It has the Star Wars license. Like, all of those should have come together as, like, a perfect storm right there. I don't know what happened. Other than, you know, it's an MMO, I guess, but... Yeah. The whole market kind of had the bottom fall out. Even World of Warcraft is losing subscribers at this point. I... (laughs) And even then, um, World of Warcraft has a new expansion coming out that's going to be huge. Sure. Which we mentioned Uh, earlier, of course, but... Undoubtedly, they're going to jump over 10 million for the month that Pandaria comes out, and then they're going to fall right back under 10 million the month after. Oh, sure, but that's still going to be money coming in. And Old Republic's not going to have that. Nope. Especially once they let go completely and go free-to-play. Well, the hope is that in free-to-play, people will be doing microtransactions to make up for the revenue they lost in subscriptions and box sales and potentially even exceed it. You'd have to be profit to say for certain, but League of Legends does okay by microtransactions. I suppose you got a point there, but I I don't know. I feel like League of Legends is more set up for uh, I don't know. I feel like their microtransaction it's content built into the game model from the very beginning. Yes, than it's hastily tacked on when everything went south. Yes, um, very much that. But I was thinking specifically, um, in a less vague manner, that. It it just seems to work with the way the game plays better. It, it it the things it's charging you for. Yes, there's the cosmetic aesthetic things, which the Old Republic's also planning on doing. But there's also those that League of Legends buys your impatience. I guess is how I want to put that. Right. The I don't feel like waiting until I have enough IP to get this. I can spend a little bit and get it right now. That is, I think, a huge help. Yes. And that's conceivably something the Old Republic could capitalize on, too. Yes, but how? Um, well, XP boosts. Ah, uh, you know, that's a thing. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd say, you know, they'd want to raise the level cap at that point, but significantly yeah. probably they probably will or the other thing they could do is just change the xp curve using the same level numbers so that mobs give less xp mm. so that free players would have to grind and you just farm mobs for an hour versus if you buy an xp boost you get the xp curve that subscribers got before yeah you know that's uh that's actually a really good idea Are you listening, Bioware? <laughs> I, 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 I just, I really wanted this, uh, this Emimoto 16. I don't know why. It's not like this is my baby or anything. It was just, well, both Bioware and that Old Republic universe. I said the Old Republic meant a lot to you back in the day. It, it still does. Yes. I've, it was an important part of when you grew up. 
that 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 was what I had I had played games before that point, obviously, but Knights of the Old Republic was I think the turning point that made me a gamer. Like that was when I could comfortably label myself that. When I was like so involved in the fandom and all this, it was Knights of the Old Republic was an amazing game. I share your love for it. And you know, if that's not enough of a glowing recommendation to pick it up on like Steam or something, if you haven't yet, then you know what the heck, guys. Seriously, it's only ten dollars. Best ten dollars you'll ever spend. Oh, speaking of um, best money I ever spent, I just recently picked up an app that I wanted to wait a little bit to talk about, but while we're uh, while we're on subjects, actually, we should probably wait until after the top after uh, the top of the hour here, so that uh, we can get all these liners and station IDs out of the way. Yep. So I'm going to actually queue up another Rise Against Song satellite, and. We'll come back and I'll talk to you about what apps I've been using lately. We'll see you in just a couple minutes on Nerd Talk. And we're back. Welcome back to Nerd Talk. I'm Pixie. I'm Pyrosim. And we've got more news to cover since we missed some stuff on our uh, last recording session. Seeing as, you know, I was recording from the inside of a car. Yes, that proved to be a bit challenging the sometimes our schedules are so busy in fact pixies in particular we don't have time to be at a computer when we're recording for the radio and so that would be why my audio was so bloody awful it happens all right so i had really bad audio last week whoops well two hours ago but um so we've got some news. Uh, I suppose we should mention, since I, we have spent a lot of time on this program, complaining rather loudly, Definitely. shall we say, yes, about, um, about DRM. We should probably mention uh, this, new, rele- this uh, new announcement from Ubisoft. So Pyro, I, I think this one's uh, right in your ballpark. Uh, Ubisoft has done basically a huge 180 on their DRM policy. Uh, They had some notorious always-on DRM, wherein the save file for your current game was written out to Ubisoft servers and never actually stored anywhere on your local computer. And if it ever tried to write the save file and could not connect to Ubisoft servers, it would then close the entire game and delete your progress. And that caused a lot of problems for a lot of people, obviously. And they got overwhelming feedback from users that this was terrible. And to quote their official statement on the issue, the the volume of support requests was so large that they decided to remove it because they just didn't want to deal with supporting all of it. So basically, translation is, well, fine, since y'all won't stop complaining and or boycotting and or threatening to boycott, I guess we can turn that off. Also, I guess it turns out that, to the great surprise of absolutely no one, they were pulling all those, what was it, 97% of our games are pirated. Th- that number was completely fabricated. And I guess I have to take that. So, Pyro. And we are back. Sorry, I had a minor technical issue there. Uh, welcome back to Nerd Talk. I'm Pixie. I'm Pyro Sim. And I was going to turn that over to you for uh, Ubisoft's DRM release. Did you have anything else to say on that? Uh, Yeah, they had one other thing, which is that they had previously made lots of public statements putting piracy rates around 97% and other simply outlandish numbers. And they have 
diplomatically backed away from those claims at this point. They're, they have not said that they're just completely false, but they're saying that they're no longer citing numbers like that. They're no longer claiming right to hide. Maybe it's because the public has just decided to pirate less or because the numbers were all made up in the first place. I'm leaning more towards the latter. I don't know about you. It seems like it. All right. So we had any other news stories that you wanted to cover that we missed? The first wave of games from Steam Greenlight is getting incorporated into the primary Steam store. And the most notable one amongst them, to my eyes, is Black Mesa. And this is really just a remake of uh, Half-Life 1 using the Source engine. But it has been fairly hotly anticipated for a number of years. It's a fan project. And if Green had not come out when it did, this probably would have just been incorporated into Steam through their regular curational process. But because Greenlight is around, now it came through Greenlight. And there are not specific release dates for this yet, but it will be coming soon, and it is going to look amazing. There's screenshots on at blackmesa.org. Um, the other thing is that there has been a change to the way the Steam Greenlight process works because originally anybody could submit any potential project to it that they wanted, and the only curational process was that users would be on them, but that immediately got flooded with garbage, and there were lots of submissions that were nonsense. As a result, Steam has, Valve has enacted a $100 developer fee one time in order to be able to post things on Greenlight. And they donate the developer fee once they receive it to Child's Play charity. Oh, this is basically just a process to prevent um, garbage from being submitted, and it was necessary because I looked at green light before this procedure was enacted. It was bad. It would be impossible to actually find any real submissions. Uh, developers kind of don't like it because they don't want to pay $100, but it seems necessary. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, you have to set a bar of entry or some kind of gate way somewhere. I mean, I understand that that's going to possibly prevent somebody from getting in who otherwise might have. But otherwise, it would be almost impossible for the users to navigate. Yeah, and it was. And now it is and user better. And user friendliness is really what we... what um what's more important the whole prioritize that over kind of that valve did not want to hire lots of additional staff to deal with this curation and green light was such that even all the steam users would not be enough additional staff to deal with all of the garbage and i'm, I'm sorry i have to change the url i said for black mesa it is blackmesasource.com well, the magic of editing is that you'll be able to fix that later. Indeed. In the meantime, we're live, so you can just be wrong. Yep. A terrible like person. You've been using some crazy awesome apps lately. Uh, yeah, there's just a couple that I wanted to mention, since those fall under my um, realm of particular geeky expertise here. Uh, there's there's a couple. Um, I've already mentioned Zombies Run, which has already you know had another patch since I've last mentioned it. Guys, it's like eight bucks on the App Store. Um, and since Pixie has talked about it, I have adopted it, and it is everything she has said it is. It is really well written, really snappy, and excellent at motivating you to run harder than you possibly believed you could. I remember linking to a, an article reviewing it on The Escapist, in which... Um, previous attempts at doing interval running, basically you run, you know, for a shorter period of time, you go faster, and then, you know, you go the rest of the way and at a, like, more reasonable pace. 
And, you know, the the answer to, okay, the time is up is just to, you know, swear loudly and then keep going at your current pace. But this is, there, there's no negotiating with the undead. And you have never run faster in your life than when you feel like you're being chased by zombies. Especially when the zombie is a notable character. And you're like, I, I know who the zombie was when it was alive. And this zombie used to run really fast when it was alive. It's going to eat me and I'm scared of it. I'm going to run as fast as I can. Have you ever been caught? Because I haven't. I've come close. Like, you know, they get to like that 15 meters and I'm just like, ah, no. I have never been caught either. It's so scary that it's like you would fall down before you could get caught. You just, you would have to be at your body's complete limit as your brain is going to push your body as hard as it'll go. It's it's it and it sounds completely ridiculous. I understand that, but it totally works. It is more effective than I expected it would be before I tried it. It it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Yes, it sounds crazy. It is very effective. But I do enjoy that. I haven't set up a zombie link account thing because that hasn't seemed super important to me. Maybe I'll change my mind on that later. But so, since I can access all of my logs from previous runs just in, in-house in the app, I don't feel like I need to on a, another website. I have not bothered to either. Um, I was also at the recommendation of the Rooster Teeth podcast, uh, picked up Game Minder, and that's how I've been able to check release dates, upcoming release dates and stuff um, on the fly, even while we're on, doing the show, which is really nice. And actually, the user interface, I've, I've looked at similar apps that have done kind of the same thing before, but the color coding and the user interface on this one are loads nicer, and I like it a whole lot, and that one's free. Um, the next one is, the, the so that's really the, the just a brief mention that I wanted to give to that because I'd been using it a lot lately and found it very helpful. Um, the next one that I want to mention, and it's going to be not quite so brief, but still probably kind of short because I've only used this thing once, is called Sleep Cycle. And I found this one, oddly enough, from a link on an Autostraddle blog, which I feel a little bit weird talking about on the radio, but okay. Autostraddle is a great place. I, I wholeheartedly recommend it on the radio. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just... I don't know any. I don't know anybody else besides you who read. I don't know anybody else besides you who reads that blog. It's a pretty good blog. It has some pictures on it. The pictures are one of the more important reasons for reading it. The text is also good. I'm 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 totally 100 percent in it for the articles, obviously. Um, so I'm going to um, I'm going to mention this one here. I also like the like DIY sections of the site that like tell you how to do stuff. I think yeah, those are, I, I like I like little crafty projects. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked here. Sleep cycle. It's this um, it's this weird little thing. What is it called? It calls itself a bio alarm clock, and it uses the accelerometer in your iPhone. I, know, I have this on an iOS device. I have no idea if it's available on other platforms. I do not believe it is. I'm sorry, what was that, Pyro? It is not. All right. I imagine there's probably similar, but the specific one, I don't think so. Um, anyway, so it uses the accelerometer here, and you kind of stick it, like, under your sheets, like, near your head on your bed. And you tell it, like, when you need to be awake by. And it basically follows the your movement while you're asleep and uses that to figure out when you're at, like, the lightest sleep stages and tries to wake you up then with, like, a more gentle tone than, like, the oh god alarm clock. And so, as a result, like, I got, according to this chart here, I got five hours and 22 minutes of sleep, and I still feel fresh as a daisy and didn't have to hit snooze a thousand times. It was great. So it gives you, like, this little 30-minute window where it'll look for, okay, when are you the most likely to, you know, be able to be woken up without terrible consequences to your REM sleep cycle. Based on how much you're moving in your sleep. Mm -hmm. If you are just completely dead and still, then it's like, well, 
you're probably very deep asleep right now. If you're rolling around, then never go. Which is, and, and then it, it creates like a neat little chart for you afterwards and gives you stats and stuff and averages. Which I, I, I would, I, I admit that I get like a weird little geeky toe curling pleasure out of seeing charts and stuff. Yay! I, I have no means to justify that at all. It's just, I, I just like it. And you, you can, you can then email or Facebook those charts if you're particularly weird which i haven't subjected my friends to yet <laughs> i did email you this just just to be like look it's a chart but it's, that it's a team. chart i was very excited to see the chart too my two world it was a very nice chart the whole email was well formatted lots of data so yeah it's got a, like an intelligence news um, that'll basically let you snooze until the end of the 30 minute window that you've given yourself It's basically you tell it I need to be up at this time and it'll go okay say I need to be up at 6 a.m. it'll look at okay so between 530 and 6 so we're looking for that window to wake you up in although honestly I, I and I did I did end up using the snooze thing once but um I didn't. I didn't use the snooze more than once, and I managed to get myself out of bed without feeling like death. And I oh, while I, still sleeping a very relatively short amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I was in shock because typically I feel like a zombie if I am getting less than nine hours of sleep. And that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But I am in the same boat. My body functions the same way. So you've got a few different alarm sounds to pick from, and they're all pretty mellow, I would say. Let's see if I can get one of. You can also select a song from your iPod, or go with the regular alarm clock sound. Though honestly, I really prefer the tones that they go with. They're very light and breezy and there's always don't make a, me wake up in a panic uh -huh. there's a severe risk with using music from your library to wake up to because you tend to develop a negative association with that music i admit that that was a problem that i had at one point um gosh what song was it I know I use um, a Shakira song La Stella for, Intuition for, um, for while I'm at work and I need to, you know, okay, my break is over, I need to go back to work. And that one started to be like a, oh, I have to go back to work kind of association, so I think I should switch that soon before yep. I get burnt out on that song. That's dangerous because it's like, this song is so amazing, but I kind of hate it a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. And not on its own merit. Like, I guess it helps that it's only just a small clip of it and not the whole thing. Like, from right. the start. And so you get a little bit of a buffer there. Uh, for a brief while, I had a section of Through the Flame by Dragon Force as my ringtone. And it was like a section from the middle of the song. And so if I would ever listen to the actual song, it would start... And I'd be like, yeah, this is music. And then it would be like two minutes in, I would get to the clip that was my ringtone. And then I would be like, this has stopped being music. And suddenly my phone is ringing. And then like 30 seconds later, it would go back and it would be like, okay, this is music again. But that was super jarring. Um, there's also the problem that if you're doing this, you can't just like set an alarm and then go do something else. It's This is a thing that you have to turn on when you are going to bed. Right. Like, this is going to be part of your nightly routine. Uh, that's not really a huge thing on the app maker's end of it, like the developer's end of it, because it uses the accelerometer. That is, its primary and almost sole function is with that accelerometer. You can't use the accelerometer in the background. That's not yep. a thing that the operating system is capable of doing. Nope. So 
So there's that. That's a little bit of a drawback. I also have to say that it's really weird putting my phone face down near and like under my sheet on my bed. That that was a little bit of a weird sensation to be all like, oh, well, now I can't see if somebody texts me. <laughs> Indeed. I always keep my. I have a little stand for my phone, and I have it such that it is highly visible from where I'm asleep. Screen is not on, but my phone had something to tell me it would be able to. Like, that's, you know, I want to be able to look at my phone first thing in the morning, and I guess I still can. It's just I'm going to have to dig for it a bit. So that's a little bit, eh. Yep. I'll have to catch up on my Twitter feed from not in bed, which I guess is... That's that's one of those first things I do. You know, I get up and then I read all of the, the tweets that I've missed while being unconscious. Me too. Because there's usually a lot of them at that point. Yep. And if I don't catch up now, I'm never going to have time th- during the rest of the day. So I do that. Um, but I suppose laying in bed for that extra few minutes reading Twitter is just, you know, my own version of hitting snooze. So I suppose it's kind of a good thing. I had some imp- from my sleep cycle when I made a conscious effort to be in my bed only when I am sleeping and stay away from my bed at all other times. And so, yeah, it is possible that by not being able to read Twitter in bed, you're just like, okay, if I'm in bed, I'm sleeping. If I'm not in bed, I'm not sleeping. Not Twitter is not part of this equation. It might be a good thing. I just love how the snooze mode works, though. The intelligent snooze is, you know, it's going to give you less and less time to snooze to try and, like, gently wake you up or whatever. Um, That you can hit snooze by either just picking up the phone or knocking or tapping on it. It's basically what you're doing is you're pawing in your sleep going, I'm just like, phone, I hit you with my hand. Eh. That's basically all you end up doing that. And I love that that basic gesture works. Yep. It's not a maneuver, it's more of a gesture. Very natural way of interacting. So, <laughs> since since I got less than five and a half hours sleep and I'm, I was like on it and rocking and on time and not running late to a million things today... D- 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 Day one, I feel like that earned my 99 cents right there. So I was Indeed. really, really happy about that, and I'm really excited. And so that's why I took like almost half an hour to talk about this. Cheaper than a fancy cup of coffee. That is also certainly true. And obviously, I'm probably going to have more to say on it when I've had a chance to use it more than once. But uh-huh. so far, I'm totally into it. This is a thing that I can I can definitely see incorporating into my life. And that's technology working to make things easier and better for me and helping to improve me as a human. Uh, that That's basically like my whole cornerstone philosophy right there, isn't it? Yeah, that's the good stuff. All right. Did we have something you wanted to mention? I have looked, the, and there seems to be a fairly similar Android app called Sleep Cycles with an S, which is a really funny way to admit it might be a case of parallel development. Yeah, but who's that developed by? Do you know? I do not know. Mm. It is different people than Sleep Cycle, but it also uses accelerometers and assesses intervals of REM sleep. That might be something worth looking into. And we can have a battle of the sleeps? Yes. That Who sounds, can sleep the best? That sounds as unexciting as anything we've ever talked about could possibly be. I could have a battle of watching paint dry. It, it's not a contest. All right, so did we have any other apps or mobile stuff or news that we wanted to cover? I had. You mentioned that you were recording from your car earlier in this program, 
and I bought an app for my phone called Tape Machine that is basically just an audio recorder with a number of fancy features like you can edit the audio after you record and they'll detect if, say, a voice is speaking versus other noise and try to only record voice. And it works pretty well. That does sound well. pretty fancy. I use... Um, I have used dedicated sound recording devices for recording lectures in classes at school before. Mm -hmm. And what my experience has taught me is smartphone is basically way better at recording sound than dedicated recording devices. Even though recording devices have better microphones, smartphones just have the giant processors in them. And being able to think about the audio is more useful. Plus, if you are super dedicated, it is possible to buy aftermarket microphones that you can plug into the headset jack and a phone. Which I imagine I, is probably what you've been doing. I have not done that yet. I have a headset that I use for actual calls and stuff, but not for recording classes. I may do that eventually. The built-in microphone is pretty powerful. and It is an electric microphone, so it doesn't have the frequency response of a computer microphone so it sounds less warm in snooty quotes but if you just want the information it does a great job I recommend it that's all I had to say about that alright so did you have anything else you wanted to bring up or should we uh, cut it up for today I think that's it. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure as always. Um, next week, we are reviewing what? Um, Dread. I, yes, Judge I know Dredd. we're seeing Judge Dread. Other than that, did we have a game we wanted to play? But I know since we're, we're, since we're about... recording on, what, Wednesday probably, um, we'll probably have a chance to play Borderlands 2. So we'll take a first look at that. Yep. Uh, Leviathan remains on the plate if you have enough time to squeeze out for that. Yeah, that's the problem is getting those story-driven single-player experiences knocked out. Yep, that will be a challenge. I have it, I just have not had a chance to get to it because my Mass Effect playthrough, the one that I'm working on right now, the Insanity one, is not that far in the story. Uh-huh. And I believe Sen was going to talk about Darksiders 2 at some point. Also, Paul keeps mentioning that we still need to play Charles Barkley's Shut Up and Jam Guide. Yes. I have actually played a fair amount of that. I have an open save file on this computer. Well, I can talk about that a little bit. All right, we could probably totally do that on next week's show then. Will do. All right, in the meantime, I'm Pixie. And I'm Parasim. And Sen's not here, so forget about him. We'll catch you next week on Nerd Talk.